But, um, and I'm plagiarizing heavily off of a doc couple documents. So one, <laughs> um, I'm your author on at least yeah, one of these. Yeah, this way. Yeah. Yeah. So several people in the room could probably give this talk much better than me, but I'm doing it. Um, so the top one is in review. Uh, so Violet, uh, Mary, and Claire were played a big part in this top QA sampling and QA QC, and then um, the Neva group has been pretty um, large group on setting standards across microplastics. Uh, so a lot of the information is coming from this. Um, and so today and like throughout this workshop we've really focused a lot on surface water. So what I'm talking about kind of is in surface water. So in the idea of if we are going to come together and do something and we're thinking we could um, try to make something semi-standard, we just have to try to think of all of the different options that are out there. and. Um, work with what we all think would be the best option for right now. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but what could we get on the board that would be close enough? And so, of course, um, whenever we do this, we have to um, start thinking of all the different things. So, for example, um, how we're going to sample, where we're going to sample, um, how we're going to deal with those whenever we're out there. Um, as far as filtration, what do we do when we get back in the lab? And then all of the other kind of hard parts about microplastics with this idea of contamination, which is a huge problem. Uh, working with blanks, how many blanks do we need? At what point is it acetone? So where it's just ridiculous amounts of time that you're spending. Um, recovery, so uh, recovery information. So can you do this technique comparati comparatively to other labs? Um, and then kind of what kind of data analysis you're gonna do and how are you gonna report it? So. Um, all the way down through those, every lab seems to be doing slightly different things oftentimes. So um, we talked about sample, um, sampling gear. So we took a grab sample where we literally just filled up some bottles with water. And so that was a very specific time point. So we were working with just one time point at that particular day. Of course, you can get a lot more complicated. So we were working with the surface water. Um, but two of the most common for sampling are going to be your grab samples where you're filling up these amber bottles or you're going to be working with these toad nets. Those are the two most common for surface water. And so some of the most common ones for surface water then would be your mantatrol, your mantanet, or some type of a plankton tow that you might be uh, drawing in a horizontal fashion from a boat, for example. And so each of these kind of have their own um, pluses and minuses. So the grab sample, so both of these are time point specific, right? It's just one time and you're taking this specific uh, reading to where um, it's pretty proven at this point or it's well validated that if you take a grab sample, you're going to get a wider range of those sizes, of course. Um, and oftentimes people that take grab samples are getting much larger uh, particle size or particles than they would get with a manta per volume anyways. And so then the manta, um, oh, sorry. Let me back up. So for the grab samples, then they're good for size inclusion. So you're making sure you're getting everything that's potentially in the water. Um, however, we did whatever 20 liters, maybe. We don't want to. How many of you guys want to hike up the LA River with like more <laughs> than what we did, right? So that was already pretty fun when me and Kara were out there hiking up the LA River and otherwise. Um, so you're pretty limited to volume, and so there's lots of questions on how representative that is of a, an area for microplastics. Um, and then these guys, most of them come, you purchase them with a very specific uh, pore size on the nets. And so most of that is 330-ish. Uh, and so you can buy different size nets. Um, but then, of course, you have this problem with you're picking up a lot of extra material. How do you deal with that extra material? Um, so you're definitely losing the smaller size class uh, most of the time if you're working with these. Otherwise, you get way too much debris. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, kind of the unspoken truth is that if you're doing surface water, you're heavily biased to those buoyant, uh, positively buoyant particles. And so there is some studies that would say that you start dropping off on particle number as you go further in depth. So if you go below about five meters, you're not picking up quite as much. So surface area is pretty um, relative. So I'm sorry, surface water to where they're saying, so the manta would be about 15 centimeters below the surface. That's kind of what you're picking up with a manta, for example. That's very similar for what a to uh, plankton tow net would be. Uh, so you're really picking up some of these. If you're doing that, your, your polyethylenes high and low polyethylenes, or for example, your polypropylenes. 
Um, and so you're heavily biased in that way. So there's papers out there that would suggest, a lot of them, right, that would suggest that uh, polyethylene is the most common particle out there in the world. Well, 90% of the studies being done are those Manta top layer um, uh, readings. So we just have to keep that in mind. Um, and then from that, we also have to kind of think of what volume are we actually sampling whenever we're working with this. So um, it's pretty, um, I think most people so far will agree, one liter is not gonna, is not good enough unless you're stratifying really well across your, your system. So most people would say that one liter is not enough. Um, the group uh, up in San Francisco, they're starting to say four liters or more is okay. Um, from some stuff that me and Carrie were doing in the bay from the Norwegian area, we thought that to kind of increase our odds, um, basically we found that there was less than one particle in this particular study per liter. And so we decided to do 20 liters to try to make sure we got at least 20 particles. So that's where the, the 20 came from um, to try to get. And so, but we were, um, of course, working with much, much smaller sizes. And so uh, her study was one of the first to kind of go that low in the, the water samples. Um, Oh. And then net systems, of course, uh, may clog given the large amount of debris you're taking in. And um, there's basically then how do you deal with that? You can't separate them apart because then maybe loss is happening or uh, maybe you didn't want to you didn't want to count all of it. That might not be representative of what actually you had in that whole system. So all these challenges. So they suggest uh, it might just be better to go ahead and do shorter toes rather than doing um, a really long toe where you're getting a lot of this debris system. Um, so these are grab samples in one period of time. You can get a lot more information perhaps if you're doing the, the auto sampler where basically you're pulling in a, a set amount of water at a particular time point um, or flow rate. Uh, so you would get a composite sample, um, working with composite samples. And so that's just kind of the question. Most of us do grab samples, but this will give you an idea of that you could uh, go across 24 hours, for example. You're still limited to volume. Um, and, but you take out a lot of that issue with debris, for example. Um, all right, so then, all right, well, what if we want to go in depth? Uh, there's multiple ways that we could go in depth. You could do a horizontal sample at a specific depth, or you could pull multiple nets at a specific depth range. I don't know if I'm going too fast because I figure most of us know a lot of these things. <clears throat> um, and then the other idea is um, whenever we are sampling, when we choose our sites, how are we going to represent our area appropriately? So this is one of the earlier documents. This is from Olympia, uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, 2013, where um, basically suggesting that we should be doing these replications at a given site. And so they, in this particular, were talking about coastal zones. And so they laid out a transect of 100 meters and then within that meter, they would choose these, um, these shorter transects, and that would be when they were going to actually do their sampling. And so, of course, as we found out whenever we went, they might have worked in Colorado Lagoon, but good luck doing that at the LA River where there's blackberries and all that kind of fun stuff blocking you from getting river access. But in theory, we um, should be doing replicates at a site. So um, most of us kind of agree that three replicates, some people do two replicates um, at a given site. Um, to try to make sure that you can create some type of an average, but there's huge range across that average. So, uh, all right. And then kind of on this conversation of how do we make sure we're doing it appropriately, so this idea with uh, secondary contamination, uh, just make sure you're cleaning surfaces. Um, you're going to filter all fluids to make sure you're pulling out any of that background noise, um, where your filter, of course, should be below what you're looking at, right? Um, you uh, probably want to be doing field blanks, so this is something that we had talked about. Is it really necessary to do field blanks? And so maybe we can talk about that, because the bottle isn't even open that long um, for these field blanks. So do we actually need a field blank, which just adds a lot more count time to your, your study? Um, versus procedural blanks, we feel pretty comfortable. Yes, we do need procedural blanks for our water. So where you're basically just taking filtered water through your whole process to deal with uh, contamination that might be falling out. Um, all right. And 
And then the other one is this idea of recovery. How well is your lab doing compared to other labs as far as, or how is uh, the minor little changes in each lab affecting how well you're getting out different things? And so right now, um, a lot of this is you're, find, you're buying uh, specific beads and you're spiking it into water and seeing how well you can pull it out knowing you had started with a certain amount. And so um, most of these studies are, or most people will go out and they'll buy these size beads um, from a couple companies. So this is just a couple where you can buy very specific sized beads um, and then you can test yourself on how well you can go across a size range. Um, and a lot of these often are, again, limited to the type. So you're kind of limited to, for example, polyethylene or polypropylene. Um, and um, so there's a couple of things. Oh, sorry. This one, this is a plug for Kara. <clears throat> Um, that are maybe not actually representative of what kind of recovery you would get from an environmental sample because they're purchased beads, they're perfect little spheres compared to what you would have with like mist or changes that would occur in environmental items. So, how are you doing, Sean? You doing good? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I agree. They're All not right. representative. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Look on your face like that's good. Um, and so then uh, Neva is one of the companies they're trying to come and as far as I'm aware they're not actually selling them just yet but they are available uh, for collaboration um, and so th what they're doing is they're starting to make pills that you could put into a matrix of interest um, with known amounts of particles or fragments and uh, fibers which has been pretty cool and so they've been a little bit limited by size but they're trying to go uh, lower in size so hopefully They'll come up with something soon that we could work with that would be a little bit more representative of things. Um, and then with that, um, kind of this idea of the background. How do you deal with that background once you have it? This idea of um, we are all pretty cool with this idea that we need the background, but then what do you do with it once you have that background? And so probably the most common is basically you'll just subtract that background from um, your counts. And so often consider the category that you're working with. So specific categories should be corrected by specific categories, right? So particles would be corrected by particle background. Fibers would be corrected by fiber background. Um, and then other things that we should consider is this idea of how confident we are compared to our blank. So it should be statistically different. Uh, and so that's what I was talking with Mary is this idea of the LOD versus the LOQ. Is that something we need to consider with our reporting very similar to the chemistry, analytical chemistry field? Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll just kind of uh, really quick just talk about some of the problems. Obviously, you guys started to see today, right? Um, you don't really feel very confident in visual assessment a lot of the times. If it's bigger particles, you do, but smaller particles, not super confident. Um, and so you uh, could produce a lot of bias, uh, especially in those smaller size classes. Um, and you might end up picking up false positives if you don't, if you just stop with that particular layer. And so um, that's kind of why we think that digestion is important to make sure that you're pulling out any of those false positives. Hopefully you're pulling out those false positives. And then um, now a lot of the journals, I think somebody brought it up previously, a lot of the journals are saying that you have to go through some of these more advanced techniques um, to even publish your work. Um, and so Mary will talk about that kind of coming in and identifying those polymers and the challenges that we've had or she's had with or their group has had with that kind of stuff, which Andy can help out as well. And so with that, I'll just kind of let her come up and talk a little bit about some of the other options that are out there right now um, and kind of where we're at with that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Sure, I mean, um, I think